Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I trust that you are here for to the um, session on how to plan a brewery event or festival. Um, my name is David Katleski. I uh, founded Empire Brewing Company in 1994, uh, started the New York State Brewers Association in 2003, um, and in 2003 I also started Central New York Festivals, Inc., which promoted uh, New York State craft beer throughout New York State, a couple of dozen events uh, throughout the state. The largest we did was on Governor's Island for 25,000 people. The smallest that we produced was uh, the uh, Central New York, well, it's called the Empire State Brewing and Music Festival, and that ranged anywhere between 2,500 people to 6,500 people. I first met Andy uh, about 20 years ago when he showed up to one of our festivals as a volunteer and said, I'm just going to follow you around and be a sponge. He was also the hardest working volunteer that we ever had at any of our festivals. And uh, I'm delighted to see that Andy took his passion and started uh, a festival company and an event company. Uh, in 2005, Andy Calamano co-founded Starfish Junction. It's a production company. Uh, it's an award-winning planning production and management company that has produced over 400 beer and brewery events. Uh, he has a BS in communications at SUNY Fredonia and a master's degree in direct and interactive marketing from NYU and deep corporate experience in the marketing space. Uh, in addition to managing Starfish Junction, Andy teaches direct marketing course at the Fashion Institute of Technology in Farmingdale State College and uh, has served as ad adjunct marketing professor at NYU. Uh, without further ado, I will like to introduce you to Andy Calamano. I should also say, sorry, I should also say that Andy is, he has had an integral part in executing uh, this, this week's events uh, and has worked closely with the New York State Brewers Association on all of our events. Uh, so Andy, take it away. So uh, I'm Andy and my goal was, I'm the guy that's been filling in the beer all over the uh, festival or the conference this weekend, so I was going to roll up some beer in here. Uh, I didn't get permission, so sorry about that. Um, what, I'm gonna, what I'm here to talk about is how to plan a brewery event and festival. And the title, the way it's written, everybody takes the time to plan a brewery. Uh, but what a lot of people don't do is take the time to plan for events or festivals. Uh, for most breweries, festivals are how you get your message out, uh, especially nowadays um, with the tasting rooms. Uh, people want to want to know, people want to go, and where people can go is the festival. So um, from that standpoint, I think the first question, and this is what you start with for the brewery, but um, it also should be, what is your goal if you're going to attend a festival? Um, how many, and you don't have to raise your hands, how many of you spent a, a good amount of time making your brewery schedule? Planning out what breweries, what beers you're gonna make for the year, what, what timetable, what ingredients you need, all that kind of stuff. Then when it comes to, oh, well, we're gonna do a festival then how much time do you actually spend on your festival uh, planning out how you're going to maximize or what do you want to get out of that festival? Um, a lot of different festivals have a lot of different goals. If it's right in your backyard, is it you want to drive people to your tasting room? Um, that's the big, the big picture right now is tasting rooms. And that's where you make your most biggest profit. It used to be distribution. Um, and it used to drive me crazy. I was talking to Dave two minutes ago when somebody at a festival would come up to somebody pouring the beer and say, where can I get your beer? And then they say, I have no idea. Um, so one of the reasons that you want to think about this a lot more 
uh, for your goals is what do you want to get out of that? If you make the same commitment to the brewery calendar, the beer calendar, that you make to your festival calendar, you're going to get a lot more out of it. There's going to be a lot more that you can plan, and hopefully you'll generate more income from your festival plan. Here's Sly Fox. Here's an event that Sly Fox came up with. How many, now this is where you can raise your hand. How many of you have ever been to the Sly Fox goat races? Fun, right? Now, yes, Peggy was the three-legged three goat. So when I went, the year I went to uh, Sly Fox, there was a three-legged goat that won the, uh, won the race. Um, now, you can't pull the goat across the line, you get disqualified. Uh, so the three-legged goat, I guess, was a lot easier to get across. The year before, uh, three-legged goat, different leg missing on the goat. So uh, uh, they didn't discriminate. If you missed a front leg or a back leg, it didn't matter. Three legs, you could win. But what Sly Fox did was they would introduce their Maybach beer the first Sunday in May, and they started the goat races. And it was a strip center where they had their brew pub, and on the side of the brew pub, they would have the goat races. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And when I say it grew, I'm not talking 50 people to 100 people. By the time they outgrew the space, they had close to 5,000 people for the day. I had a block down the street. They had to work with the local police. They actually moved the race to uh, their new brewery a couple years back. They had over 5,000 people. There were people in campers that were not even close enough to see the races. They had the big, the big screens. This was all started because they wanted to figure out a way of how to sell their Maybach beer. This is this type of thing that you can do if you think, think about it. And what, what's nice about this is the contestants brought their own goats. It did not cost Sly Fox any money to get the goats. So when you think about doing an event, right, you're always thinking, well, what's going to be my cost? For Sly Fox, the, the event itself with the goats, there was no money. They didn't have to put pens together. The, the people that had to brought the goats would keep the goats. Now, they had heats on the goats, and sometimes the goats would go forward, sometimes they would go backwards. It didn't matter. But they put enough time in between the heats that they sold more and more Maybach and the rest of Sly Fox's beer. Not only did they sell a lot of draft that day, they sold an incredible amount of package that left. And then they had teams that made their own shirts. This was an event, if you go on to YouTube now, um, has taken its own life in terms of people look forward to Sly Fox's uh, goat races. Now, this is a brewery event. Every brewery should, should, if they want, have at least one event that's their event, that you can make it your event, because not what those events do is it brings people back to your brewery, back to your tasting room, um, and people look forward to it. And, it. and if you do it right, it just grows and grows and grows and you really don't have to worry about how much more it's going to cost. For Sly Fox, when they got to their new brewery, they rented the big screen, but that was a cost already factored in based on how much beer they sold the week before, the year before. They, um, they factor in how much they could sell uh, the day of. And think about that. If you could get all those sales in, at your uh, tasting room, and not at another place and keep those costs, what a day that would make for you, what a month that would make for you, maybe even, you know, for your year, for your year. And while they were there, 
they were also building relationships. So they had distribution uh, relationships. So what they were doing was they were inviting their distributors down to see the goat races. And the beer business, everybody knows, is all about relationships. The more relationships you have, the better relationships you have, the more beer you're going to be able to sell. And that's what it comes down to for events at your brewery or even when you're going to a festival. It's the relationships that you're building. Um, for, for Sly Fox, over time, they started to, inv to invest, not invest, well, they did invest the time to invite down their distributors and their personnel. And their personnel came back, and now they had stories to tell about Sly Fox and this crazy event that they spent. On the weekend, they saw a three, a three-legged goat win a race. They saw a goat go backwards. They saw big goats, little goats, all kinds of goats. And then that, when they went to talk to uh, retailers, hey, you should have come down to Sly Fox. That's where that relationship factor really comes into play. Here's another brewery that's been doing their Cask Ale Festival for over 18 years. The first one, this is Blue Point, they do it in Blue Point, Long Island. I got involved the second year, not the first year. The first year what happened was one of the brewers said to a bunch of his brewer friends, let's have a cask festival. And so they decided to have it at Blue Point. They got, this sounds weird, but they got lucky. It was a major snowstorm because they ran out of beer and they were totally overwhelmed. If there had been no snowstorm, it would have been crushing. Um, but with the uh, snowstorm, kept, they only had about 600 people that showed up and drank all the cask beer. Uh, from there, I got involved the second year, and every year it's grown. Um, and it's, it started out in January. And I can tell you, you know, a lot of people, depending on where you are, we live in New York, so it's a cold state. But Friday night, guaranteed, setting up would be the most coldest night in the world. Uh, and we'd be putting up the tents and getting the tables up and everything. Then Saturday, for some reason, could have been because I was so cold on Friday. It warmed up a little bit on Saturday, and we had the festival. Then we had to move it to April. The only reason we moved it to April was because the town wouldn't let us have the uh, cask festival anymore in January with the walls closed. So if you didn't have walls, you could have more people at the festival. So we moved it to April, and then people just kept coming. And now it's been moved to November because of COVID. Um, had a nice turnout the last, last November. We'll see what happens. But this is, once again, is another event that people look forward to. Um, they sold most of their tickets for, in the tasting room, um, bringing people into the tasting room. When it was in January, it was great because that was a nice bump for them. How many uh, of you have tough Januaries? Um, then it moved to April, and it was still a good month for them. Uh, November, uh, they did very well. So, wait, one went backwards. So now they have a new event. So they're doing the Blue Point Shakedown on Main Street on April 20th, which is a Wednesday with a band. They've decided to move their cask festival out of April and into November. It's going to be interesting to see that where, where, where the cask festival ends, because now when it was in April, it was a lot of fun and it stood out. In November, how many people have your weekends in the fall like booked? Whether there's soccer games, football games, high school games, college games, everything under the sun. Um, but they've decided that they want to try this out. So they've taken an event that was 18 years and a success. One of the things that, you know, for events, people like the repetition of the same time of the year. So if you're going to do something at your brewery, and, you know, I gave you 
to the process of a goat race with three legs. You can come up with other kinds of races. I still haven't figured out how to do baby races, but one, one of these days uh, we'll get that done. But people like to plan on their calendar an event over and over. So there's a lot of opportunities. And what's, what's really nice about doing an event at your brewery is you, you keep all your costs down. Um, you don't have costs beyond that. Here's, here's another one. Uh, Long Island does a halfway to St. Patrick's Day. Why can't there be halfway to everything else? Halfway to, Saint, to, to Christmas, halfway to Easter, halfway to Halloween. You know, all these are good opportunities for, brew, for you guys to have some kind of event at your brewery. Um, if you can tie it in with a release or a limited release, that's all the better. Um, Southampton, which uh, was a brewery that is no longer around, they we're a little mismanaged, that's all I'll say. Um, they used to do, on Saturday mornings, bottle releases. And I know bottles are not that popular now anymore, but what they used to do was get people lined up in front of their brew pub and people would buy the bottles because that was when it came out and then they would stay for breakfast or lunch. You know, there's a lot of things that, we're a culture that recycles. How many of you beer dinners came and they went and I bet if you started doing beer dinners again, they would be more, that much more popular. People are looking for things to do with their friends that, and this is what we found, our events, especially the beer events, are 21 and older. You have a built-in audience of 21 and older that want to do, they've spent the last two years with their kids. They won't. <laughs> I know, yeah, and they love their kids and everything, but they want to get out with their friends or their relatives and, and have experiences that are 21 and older. Um, so I put up the halfway to St. Patrick's Day because not only, and we're right, right around the corner for St. Patrick's Day, but there's so many other holidays that you could do a halfway to, or you could brew a special release for that beer for that beer for your brewery and have it come to and have the event at your brewery. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be St. Patrick's Day. This is our Valley Forge Festival um, that I've done for a couple years. We had to take the last two years off like everybody else in this room uh, for, for events. But the Valley Forge Festival, we just did for the first time after two years um, last December and we had a, a record-breaking amount of people come out um, what we've seen and the reason I put it in here is we um, we have seen and I've been doing festivals for 15 years is that I don't mean to insult anybody but the beer geeks can get the beer wherever they want to get the beer they can get the special releases what people want is they want to go out with their friends. They want to try new things because they didn't try anything new during COVID. You have the, you have the sales records for that. Um, they want to try stuff. They want to be able to talk to their friends. And then they want to be able to, in this case, we always do a survey, go out to dinner afterwards uh, for the festival. So those are the types of things that can be done. You know, this is the Great Beer Expo we do in New Jersey. It's the day before the Meadowlands. How many of you guys do an event before the Super Bowl, the Saturday before the Super Bowl? Nobody goes anywhere for the Super Bowl. They stay home. So if you've got a brewery and you came out with a release the day before and you had something in your brewery and I'm not telling you exactly what to do because you guys all have your own opinions but you have breweries to do stuff at. The day before the Super Bowl is an excellent day 
to do something, whether you release a, 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 a beer for the Super Bowl, you can't obviously call it the Super Bowl or you'll get the NFL upset with you, but you are very creative with, with the names of your beers, I know. I've been putting them out all weekend. So, uh, but why not do something the day before the Super Bowl? People are going to be free. They're at home, they're not traveling. Super Bowl doesn't start till six o'clock, 6.30 the next day. So they have all day to sleep. And then they're drinking your beer with their friends at the Super Bowl because you made a special release. Um, that's just something to think about those opportunities. Um, you need to create your own opportunities. It's the same, and this goes back to the beginning, when I said putting a plan together, your own plan of events or your own plan of festivals, it's important um, that you do that. Now, here's a very nice brewery. They, they, have, uh, they have the banner They've got a little uh, blackboard right down there. But, and they, they actually even have right here, says what they're for. How many of you go to a festival and write down what, you, what you're gonna pour at the festival? It should be there. And how many of you make a QR code so that they can take a picture of it? Beat me, you beat me to the punch. <laughs> you, you, uh, Paying attention. You, uh, you, you, nice job, nice job. Yeah, what I was gonna say is, most people going to a festival, they have their cameras now, they can take pictures, everybody can take pictures. Everything in your booth should be picture ready, bigger, up higher, so that they can take the picture for this, you know, you have to walk all the way up to it before you see it and what it is. So, but at least they had a description. In the, for me, as a festival person, my challenge is I place an order. I place the order from what you guys want me to have at my brewery. I get my delivery on Thursday, Friday. And the distributor does, does not, the, sorry, the distributor does not deliver what I ordered. So I'd be happy to make the signs at the festivals, um, but there's consistency. The other thing that, you know, and this goes part of what your plan is and what your strategy is, is if you're going to recommend the beer for a for a festival, you may want to see if your your distributor has that beer so that we can pour that beer, so that you can pour the beer. Um, a lot of times we will take whatever the recommendation is and we'll find out that that beer isn't, in, in, isn't available. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. That's part of that planning. Now here's, uh, I'm not picking on Trogues, um, but for this, for this display, you know, I think the biggest thing is nowadays is, do you want to drive somebody back to your tasting room? And that doesn't, that doesn't drive me back. Here's a, it's not a beer, it's a seltzer, so um, they put up banners, but we're gonna go back to that. But here's two breweries next to each other. One has great graphics, but the other one, alternative endings, has descriptions of the beers. I think that's key. People wanna know what they're drinking, uh, going up front to see what that's, what's there. This is great, it's bright and everything, and it's, it's nice to be at a festival and see it, but the end goal, I think everybody in this room is to sell more beer. It's not to be the best looking. It's really, how do you drive people 
to, uh, to buy more beer. And if they've tasted these beers and they take the pictures of the al alternative endings, that's a lot, it's gonna go a long way. <coughs> now here's Oscar Blues. This is a great display of all the products, but there's no, once again, where do you go to, to purchase it? This goes to, and I was talking to Dave about this, everybody's afraid uh, to put the top five uh, pe people or retailers. So for, for, for a brewery, if you're at a festival, right, and you're selling, um, you're doing sampling, why can't you just post your top five places to buy your beer? It used to be, and nothing's more frustrating than uh, when I hear a consumer come up to somebody and say, uh, where can I get your beer? And they say, Okay, but I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not, I can do that if we, right. I apologize on that one. But for me, I can, I can post or list the top five if I got the names, uh, which is not a problem. So it's the same thing. They're pouring their beer, but there's not really where to go to. And these are just different. This, I think, is the, the key to it is, and let me go back, how do you get people to your tasting room? We've made signs for brewers um, where it tells you, and this isn't illegal, um, <laughs> driving, <laughs> driving dri where, where the brewery is, what the tasting room hours are. If you can't post because it's illegal, you can certainly post your tasting room hours. That should be something that should be in your checklist of when you're gearing up for a festival that you have your sign for where your tasting room hours are um, so that you can drive people. Now, in terms of promotions and stuff like this, so I will be more careful, but one of the things you can do uh, when you're at going to a festival and is inviting maybe a retailer to pour the beer. Is that illegal? Not if they volunteer. Not if they volunteer. But to, to uh, have one of your volunteers come to the show or one of your customers come to the show as a volunteer, let them pour and spend an hour with you, build that relationship with you and then let them enjoy the show. Um, that gives you somebody to pour the beer and also gives you an hour with them uh, building that relationship. A lot of what can be done at festivals is building relationships that are, that are important, whether it's working with your distributor uh, to bring your beer or working with doing promotions at the festival uh, bringing your beer ahead of time. The other one is um, if you know your brewer is going to be there or somebody from the brewery is going to be there, that's an opportunity to promote that person there. I think as an industry, this is my 15 years of seeing what's out there, there used to be personalities that would come to festivals and they'd be, draw big crowds. Um, and they started out and they, they loved it. What I'm finding now is that it's harder to get because you're working six, seven days a week, but getting personalities to the events so that people meet you. It's all about the relationships. You know, uh, Sam uh, early on spent, he would be at his booth when he was at events only for about an hour, then he would disappear, but he would be at the event and would create a lot of excitement. Um, 
that did a lot. Garrett Oliver was a big fan of that in the beginning. And I know one of the things that is key for festivals is pick and choose. You don't have to be at every single festival. I mean, I know that goes against everything that a festival guy would say, but I almost would rather you choose and limit the amount of festivals you go to, because then it's special, and then promote those festivals that you're gonna be at. Um, you work hard enough Monday through Friday that you don't need to be at every single festival. But I think there are certain festivals, if you time it, you time special releases, work with the festival people with beers that are gonna come out within a week or two weeks, and celebrate that at the festival and let the festival person, uh, the festival organizer know, they'll be able to t take that in and publicize that even more. So take your marketing effort for a new beer and take the next step and move it even more uh, from, from that perspective. But I think the key to festivals and, and doing your own events is, just to wrap it up, is to take up, to, is to take your time planning what you want to do with it. You spend a lot of time making the beers. You should um, spend just as much time putting a plan together to do your festivals for, for the year. So from there. Um, is there any questions? Depends who's who's doing. If it's a race, right? Who's doing the who's applying f for the SLA permit? If that's where the checklist begins, so well, you have to, if you're going to if you're going to serve beer at the end, yeah. Or if you're going to come up afterwards, we can talk a little bit about that. It, yeah. it, not a bad idea, though. You know, maybe from the New York State Brewers Association, we could provide some type of uh, broad checklist because I have checklists for every, any event that I would do, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure Andy does too. They yep. do vary uh, according to municipalities. Some require a different set of um, licenses or fees or what have you. Uh, I've even done festivals where they dictated how many porta potties you had per hundred people. So, uh, I mean, you have to consider that, right? The last thing you want to do is have a big event, 5,000 people show up and you don't have enough bathrooms because trust me, that's the picture that's on the cover of the newspaper the next day, been there. <laughs> so you have to be uh, a weary of that. But yeah, I'm sure we as an organization could provide a raw checklist and post it on our website. Any other questions? And sometimes the community may be at the end of the rope right. and they need new blood to, to put on that event that's been around for 75 years and you can jump in and take over that event and uh, make, it, make it keep going. You know, you're going to see a lot of uh, events um, start to go away. Uh, in my area, the Polish Fair um, was huge. Uh, for years and years and years, and what happened was there was a 
bunch of old ladies, they're in their 80s now, that never wanted to share any power. And so nobody was allowed to help them with the Polish fair. And now the Polish fair is not what it was. Um, but there's going to be new blood eventually. And uh, there may be that opportunity to take a look at your community and see what needs to be saved. Is there anybody here from Greenport Harbor? Last night, we were all hanging out, and um, Rich was telling me about, Rich Vandenberg, the, one of the co-founders, uh, was telling me about a dog event that they brought, a dog racing event that they brought over. And it, sorry? Dog diving. Can, can you tell us a little history behind how that happened? Because I understand that it's, it, it was a functioning event that then moved over to the brewery. I mean, it's it's great opportunity to think outside the box. Andy touched on. Uh, there's a question. <laughs> that was an earlier seminar on insurance. <laughs> the, the the organization would have to provide and and add you on as additional insured to protect you. Uh, Andy touched on something interesting about Super Bowls. And it made me think about this Central New York Brew Fest that happens at the New York State Fairgrounds every year. We always know that it's on the Saturday before Super Bowl Sunday. We just always know it's that date. You don't have to really think about what date you're going out to the State Fair because they've established themselves the day before the Super Bowl. So I really think he touched on something there, uh, something to think about. Yeah. Oh, it did? <laughs> well, it's a COVID thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. COVID, COVID, COVID. Any other questions? All right. Well, All thanks right. for coming out. Thank you out. very much. Thank you, Andy, for, uh, for doing this for us.